Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Goethe Institute in Exile, to our panel series. Um, I'm very happy to um, welcome you to the second panel of this um, series that we are organizing this, uh, for this opening festival. Um, this uh, uh, panel will be moderated by my colleague Regina Sarreiter. I'm very happy that she's moderating it. She's an expert, so I'm happy to have her around us. Um, Regina Zareta was uh, is currently at the um, Department of Fine Arts and um, in the Goethe Institute headquarters in Munich. She's an anthropolo anthropo anthropologist and um, has been a curator and researcher in various institutions in Germany. And um, this panel will be about cultural heritage and the how to kind of, of um, uh, yeah, save it and what are the risks actually in, uh, of that cultural heritage is facing as well. Um, and it's for us, this panel series is a way of presenting actually as well different um, topics that are not, maybe not all addressed in this festival here. We have a strong focus on Ukraine, which is the opening um, um, fo um, focus of uh, Goethe Institute in Exile. But with this panel series, we are trying to enlarge a little bit the, the, the perspectives and address as well other topics um, at, and uh, address as well other countries that we um, are, will be having as a, as a focus countries as well in the, in the following months. So um, for this panel series, we are really uh, kind of, of opening the debate as well on, on other topics. And we have a follow-up panel after this one, which will be in cooperation with the um, Deutsche Zentrum für Integrations- and Migrationsforschung, the DZIM, uh, addressing, for instance, cultural policy at large and the, the, the shrinking spaces of cultural policy, policy nowadays. Um, so if you want to stay afterwards, you're much welcome. But now I want to hand over to Regina and to introduce the panel. Thank you very much. This is working. Thank you very much, Marc André, for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm very delighted to be able to moderate this panel, and I'm very much looking forward to a conversation that we're going to have. Um, I have to announce uh, one uh, unfortunate thing in the beginning. We were supposed to be five people here on the panel, but one person, Susan Harder, unfortunately got stuck in the train, because there was a train situation this morning in North uh, uh, North Germany, and uh, now she is sitting in a train without a conductor, so unfortunately she can't be here with us. But I'm still very happy that the three other panelists are sitting here with me, and, um, and that we also have an audience. Uh, I'm going to engage you in the conversation as well, as you are not so many, <laughs> so prepare your questions and be very attentive. Um, before I introduce the panel, I will just give a little bit of an introduction into the topic because we are speaking today about the uh, protection of art and cultural goods and already this is quite a span because I mean we always talk about uh, the protection of cultural goods in times of crisis but I'm very happy that my colleagues included the term art as well in the title because uh, we have a panel here of people who are not all working in the area of the protection of cultural goods, but who are cultural producers or artists themselves. And I think it's very important to link these two things, because we're not only talking about the protection of cultural heritage, as in monuments, museums, or archives, but we're also talking about the protection of what is happening right now of the cultural production in countries that are in a situation of war or in a situation of crisis. So I think this is a very important um, add to this, uh, to this discussion. And uh, maybe, uh, because I think many of us maybe are familiar with uh, the, ha the Hague uh, Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the event of, in the event of armed conflict, which um, suggests, or not just suggests, but um, which states that any damage to cultural property irrespective of the people it belongs to is a damage to the cultural heritage of all humanity because every people contributes to the world's culture. I think this is a very important thing, the, um, important uh, note and, and rule, and we see that it is broken all the time in every war, in every crisis, because um, cultural heritage is destroyed. But then again, I'm very thankful to the special rapporteur um, in the cultural field, Farida Shahid, who was the special rapporteur, I think, between 2009 and 2015, 
who added to that that the protection of the people who produce art and culture is as well as important and that the, the access to culture and to cultural production is a right. She calls it the right to culture. So I think with these uh, few thoughts in mind, I'm going to uh, introduce our panel and I'm going to start on my left. Um, here we have uh, Anna Potionkina. Uh, she's a cultural producer who studied at the Liefar National Academy of Arts. She is a member of Insha Osvita, I hope I pronounced it well, an NGO for non-formal education in Ukraine, uh, where she also works as a facilitator in the trainer's pool. Uh, she's also the co-founder and the curator of Assortiment na Kimnata, a project space in ivano Frankivsk. <laughs> so I'm very happy that you're here with us. She just arrived from Poland yesterday, I guess, yeah. Then next to her is Tobias Busen. He is an architectural historian and coordinator of the Archaeological Heritage Network and has been a scientific officer at the German Archaeological Institute since 2020. He studied architecture at the Technical University of Munich and wrote his doctoral thesis on the history of the Villa Pausilifpon near Naples in Italy. Then just next to me is Sarah Nabil, uh, she's born in Kabul, where she also studied political science at the Karwan University. At the moment, she is a student at the Hochschule für Gestaltung in Offenbach am Main, where she is taking part in the class of Heiner Blum. Uh, the, it's a class for experimental spatial concepts. Since 2008, her, uh, her work has been, because she is working as an artist as well, her work has been shown widely in Germany, Afghanistan, Austria, Spain, Italy, India, Nepal, Norway, and the US. And her last exhibition was in Mannheim, which is, we're talking about this before. So I'm very, very happy that you are all here. And to start our conversation, I would just uh, like you all to briefly introduce um, your um, your engagement in the field of the protection of, of the arts and also the protection of cultural goods. And I would propose that, Anna, maybe you start. Yeah, um, is it working? Yeah, working. Uh, hi, everyone. And uh, I just wanted uh, to start from uh, saying thank you for invitation. Um, yeah. Um, I just uh, got from uh, Lutz, from Poland, but before uh, I was in Ukraine, I have to say that right now it's a very, very long way to make uh, from Ukraine to here. Uh, but it's something that we, a lot of Ukrainians have to do, uh, just to be present uh, and to speak um, uh, in a public way. So basically what I will mostly talk about today uh, will be the case of Assortiment na Kimnata, which is... Uh, um, a project space, um, a gallery in Ivano-Frankivsk. Uh, it's the western part of Ukraine, so basically it's like more or less safe place right now. And um, I would also say a few words what we used to do before the full-scale invasion. We used to do um, exhibitional programs, we used to make residencies, uh, we used to show uh, movies, um, make some small musical events. So basically all kind of things and when, and also before full-scale invasion we had a dream uh, to start uh, collecting our own, own archive of um, uh, art objects, um, focusing on the um, local art uh, which, which would be produced in Ivano-Frankivsk and which was produced in Ivano-Frankivsk. And uh, I think with this uh, idea in our mind, we somehow entered um, 24th of uh, February. Um, and exactly at that day, uh, me and my colleague, uh, Alona Karavai, who is also running the space, uh, like between the dialogues about what, sh what we should do as uh, people, you know, entering the war, the full-scale invasion, and uh, maybe we should go to the territory defense, or like, what should we do? And um, between these messages in the chat, um, Alona proposes me, okay, maybe we should concentrate on something that we have at least some 
expert, um, you know, where we are at least uh, a little bit of experts, uh, maybe we should launch a program for evacuation of art objects. And of course, at that time, it wasn't, we were, we were not sure that ivano Frankivsk would be the safest place in Ukraine, and maybe it would be a mistake to evacuate things there. But it was our um, hypothesis that maybe it will be, and it, we also had a hypothesis that big collection, big, big art collections somehow will be protected, somehow government has a plan uh, uh, or something, and such small organizations, uh, grassroots organizations as we are, they won't be protected. And actually, I would say that even big collections were not protected because when you face war, I mean, all the plans, all the metho methodology just breaks uh, through the wall <laughs> of the uh, destruction and uh, killing people. So um, people who, and institutions who, um, from whom we got requests in this program were small and big. These were individual artists, small galleries, big galleries, so like all kinds of institutions. And yeah, we um, somehow managed to evacuate 600 pieces, which is not a lot, but uh, this is something that, that we at least could do. Um, yeah, and not to take a lot of time right now, uh, I would also say that another thing about which I will speak today was another program that happened also in the same time when evacuation was happening. It's a, a program of uh, residency for displaced artists. So for those who um, decided to stay in Ukraine or for those who could not leave Ukraine, like men, uh, because they are not allowed to leave the country. And uh, in Ivano-Frankivsk we collected, we like got together 17 artists and um, somehow made a space um, which was hard in the beginning because you cannot think in terms of producing art and like thinking about art when things are going on around you. But this residency lasted for three months and the outcomes of this residencies, the residency are right now for us this testimony, this um, um, testimony that has a poetic uh, also vision and poetic, uh, in a way is poetical and for us, and I hope for the external audience is a little bit stronger than uh, media, uh, than something which is going on through media because we, I think, all got used to um, bad events that are uh, that we are hearing from media and somehow we also lose our sensitivity to that to that and i think art can be something that can deal with that a little bit at least um yeah maybe i will stop here and pass my word uh, i will tell something more in our further conversation yeah No? Yes, now it is. Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, as was said before, I'm here on behalf of the German Archaeological Institute, the DAI, um, which normally the main mission is to conduct archaeological research worldwide, so abroad, not in Germany. Um, and this, of course, uh, includes always the preservation and safeguarding of cultural heritage because we are working in, or uh, my colleagues are working in different archaeological sites and places around the world and it's uh, also an obligation to, to preserve and to safeguard the cultural heritage that we are dealing with uh, that is entrusted to the colleagues on, on site. So um, what I would like to talk about today are different topics. Uh, one is the main project we are engaged with at the moment, which is called Kulturgutretter in German. Um, this project aims at uh, providing resources from Germany to be able to offer immediate help after a disaster strikes somewhere. This is not limited to, to uh, armed conflicts. Uh, on the, it's the other way around. We are thinking maybe um, about natural disasters or man-made disasters uh, everywhere in the world. Um, so this means we uh, would like to have the capacities to, to deploy teams of cultural heritage experts from Germany with predefined equipment and uh, of course on request by an affected country or uh, institution from another country. Um, 
to go there and to help and to work together with the local stakeholders and the local uh, forces to uh, save to to uh, to protect in that moment the cultural heritage that is uh, destroyed or damaged or at risk. So this can also mean evacuation of museums or uh, say or protecting buildings. So we have we always have to think about collections, libraries, archives, but also. Uh, yeah, the built heritage, which cannot be moved that easily. We will come back to that maybe later. Um, this is something we do not alone, but uh, together with the Civil Protection uh, Institution in Germany, the Federal uh, Agency for Technical Relief, THW, um, and the Leibniz Research Institute for Archaeology in Mainz, the römisch germanisches Zentralmuseum, uh, would be the name in German. <laughs> so, um, this is not uh, the first project we are working on uh, when we talk about protecting cultural heritage because uh, as an answer to the crisis in the Middle East um, in 2016, the DAI together with other partners in Germany founded the uh, Archaeological Heritage Network that you mentioned at the, in my introduction. Uh, and the objective was to concentrate expertise that is, ex exists in Germany um, on preserving and safeguarding cultural heritage for everywhere around the world, so for uh, activities abroad. And um, so from 2016 on, there were many projects in a joint main project that was called Stunde Null, Zero Hour. So um, this was, uh, had two focal points. One was to, um, to create capacity, to build capacity for uh, experts that had fled from countries, for example, from Syria. Uh, so we had capacity building programs in surrounding countries, Turkey, uh, Lebanon, etc. Um, and the other thing was to uh, build up digital uh, background, so digitalizing projects, uh, digitizing inventories, archives. So uh, once a crisis or a conflict is over, that these experts were prepared to go back and to work uh, and help with more knowledge and more uh, awareness to rebuild to uh, yeah to on the cultural heritage so while these projects were more uh, of uh, mitigation or also preparation uh, for safeguarding cultural heritage kulturgutretta this cultural heritage response unit in english uh, is for the rapid immediate help when a disaster strikes it was not intended for armed conflicts, and then the war in Ukraine started. So uh, this is the third thing I want to explain. Um, because, as I said, this is intended to, to work with civil protection, so with, with uh, technical humanitarian aid and not uh, with the military. Um, so what to do? <laughs> it's a project that is dealing with these problems, and we see uh, and we hear from the news from February on the destruction of uh, buildings, of archives, of uh, built heritage in Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, the German Archaeological Institute immediately uh, got requests from Ukrainian colleagues to save, uh, for example, to back up data on cultural heritage. So, we again are talking about the digital uh, thing. So, the German Institute offered uh, space to back up data, inventories, information on cultural heritage. And uh, with thanks to the Federal Foreign Office and the Hasso Platner Foundation, uh, we also were able to offer scholarship grants to Ukrainian colleagues, so they had the funding to do this work of backupping and uh, saving data on the cultural heritage. Uh, and then uh, we, uh, even also in March, we started to establish a, a logistics network, because we said if we cannot go there, at least we can send material. And not material, I mean the most important thing is humanitarian aid, but in the second phase it's important we knew from our colleagues from Ukraine that it was needed uh, material to package, for example, uh, collections that had to be evacuated or were at risk. So uh, together with Blue Shield Germany, Susan Hada is missing today, but uh, she's one of our partners, or the Blue Shield Germany is one of the partners, the German Association for uh, Cultural Heritage Protection, Deutsche Gesellschaft für Kulturguterschutz, um, the team of SILK, the Sicherheitsleitfaden uh, for collections, museum collections, and regional uh, emergency associations that we have in Germany, the so-called Notfallverbünde. Uh, we established this logistic network and we collected um, during weeks and months, uh, a lot of packaging material for cultural heritage assets. So for museum collections, this was specialized material uh, for archives, but also uh, 
bubble wrap, <laughs> simple stuff that you need to, to take it uh, out of the museum. Uh, until now, we have uh, sent uh, more than uh, 35 tons of material to Ukraine in uh, two or three uh, steps, and more will follow. So uh, in this case, the, the THW, the Federal Agency for Technical Relief, uh, was a big help because they uh, organized all the transport logistics. And we used uh, something that not everyone might know about the Union Civil Protection Mechanism, which is an European mechanism by the European Union to, uh, to help in cases of international or European disasters uh, on humanitarian but also on cultural um, emergencies. Um, so this said, because I don't want to take more time with this introduction, um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the, introdu uh, for the invitation. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the dis discussion and exchange with you. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, first of all, uh, really thank you for uh, making this program because um, I'm coming from art section. Yeah, I was also in Afghanistan working the yeah, art and culture, but not in heritage. Uh, but um, in last since 2021, 15 of 2021, uh, 15 of August 2021, as the collapse uh, happened in Afghanistan and the Taliban, uh, this terrorist group which are don't believe in art and culture, they got the power. Um, and at the same time, these countries uh, we are dealing with lots of problems. It's not only just one crisis; so it's humanitarian crisis. It's the Taliban, and it makes more difficult. Um, yeah, and. Uh, since one year, there's lots of program about Afghanistan, but it's more political. They are talking about the political issues and economic, but not about art and culture, which is really important. So without art and culture, so I think uh, a country or that people cannot um, exist. So it's their history. Um, that's why I thank you, and it's important. Uh, from my field, what we, this, about this engagement, so, Right now, the crisis, what's happening in Afghanistan, it's lots of crisis. It's not only so um, that uh, because the most problem is because when we have a war, then the most of the art and culture, they're all uh, treated by bombs or by uh, rockets. But when you have, in the same time, uh, this uh, conflict, and at the same time, you have a um, authority that they are completely, uh, they are the dictators, they don't believe in art, they are fundamental, they are very extremists. So it makes, and it closes all the ways that you can't do anything there. The only thing that you do in human crisis that to at least to save the lives, those who produce arts, so artists. Um, for example, what we did in one year, so try to um, evacuate these people, the artists, do, uh, those who actively work in, in Afghanistan and produce art. And uh, this is what, um, um, not me, so with a group of people, we, and it was also successful that about more 230 people was already evacuated from Afghanistan. But it's just there, yeah, we just saved the life. We not, the, the life of these people are safe, the artists. But uh, still, the all artworks, the all heritage, the all monument is left there. And we don't know what's going to happen with them because with Taliban, you couldn't think, you can have any, uh, how to say, um, um, uh, Expectations, sorry, my English, since I'm learning German, I forgot <laughs> even my mother, uh, my mother language, so, uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, you can't have any expectations. We saw what they did on their first uh, regime uh, from 1996 till 2001, even they destroyed the big Buddha statues in Afghanistan. And right now the problem is uh, because uh, most of people, those who actively work in Afghanistan, in the, especially civil society activists, they are all evacuated. And there is no, not any bridge that we got information from there that what's going on. And all the world and also, yeah, we are all uh, busy to uh, save the lives, but we forgot the most important things. These are all, um, this is heritage. For example, um, we have the experience as the Taliban on uh, their first uh, ta um, regime. They destroyed all the artworks and national gallery. They burned them. They uh, also the um, uh, from the national museum. They bring all the statues that was really uh, important for this country. They bring it in the black mark 
market and they sell it. And right now, um, we don't know, I, I don't know, I'm a person that I start art at with the age of 14, and I was actively engaged with this situation of the art scene in Afghanistan. Even I don't know what's going on there because there isn't any bridge with, uh, in Afghanistan to know about these things. And also the, the organizations, um, they are not, uh, yeah, but because of lots of reasons. So as I said, there's always our blo block and we don't know how to work also with this issue, safeguarding heritage, art, and culture right now in this crisis. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, this is lots of points that we could further discuss on. But I think you said something very important, and this is something that you also mentioned in the beginning, like this, um, I wouldn't even call it trust, but this expectation, as you said, that at least the cultural heritage will be preserved by the international community, for example. I mean, we have mechanisms, as you just, as you just explained, Tobias, that, um, that are prepared to intervene, but then there are situations where there is no way that you can even access the places, the sites, the museums. So I think it's a very tricky, tricky moment that we're facing. And uh, I wanted to come back to, to you, Anna, um, because, uh, I mean, also related to this question of who takes care of what and, and the initiative that you took to kind of build up a, a safe space for art or kind of a, a rescue place. Um, maybe you can, you can expand a little bit on that because I think we all cannot really imagine what that means. I mean, how do you, uh, I mean, of course, you reach out to people and offer this space, but how does it actually work? Are people kind of coming with their suitcases, uh, have their artworks in there, or just put everything into the car and, and drive to you? So maybe you can... Yeah. Yeah, so basically talking about this uh, program of ev evacuation, uh, basically it all happened, like, it all started as a... Uh, open call that we launched, uh, you know, through our social media and also our partners and our friends uh, widely spread it. And we um, we actually launched like a few, uh, we understood at that moment that we uh, also need resources. So we launched an op open call for our international friends to support that. And uh, another thing, another open call that we launched was the for volunteers uh, on the places uh, on the city in the cities uh, from where the requests would come, uh, because uh, um, there was a big uh, problem with uh, transportation and with moving, actually moving um, a person, moving uh, art object, like moving anything, because. Uh, um, maybe you know that, um, like this first weeks, first month of the full-scale invasion was the situation when people were uh, driving like 40 hours in the car trying to get out from point A to point B or like trying to go to the western part. So uh, in this case, uh, we had like a big, big problem uh, with transportation and with finding actually people who were ready to go by the car to Kiev, for example, or to Odessa, or somewhere else, and to pick up the art objects, because um, the people who would uh, send us the requests, uh, like 90% of all the, uh, all the cases, they were not able to, uh, to drive on their own, or they were not able to send it somehow, because also, like, uh, uh, postal um, services didn't work properly and the work could stuck for like uh, a month uh, through the postal office uh, th through the postal service so it was like a big uh, big big question of how how you can find people who are ready to do that and what we also um, found as a, like a um, answer for that, we would um, send, um, because there were also a lot, a big traffic of humanitarian aid and of like things that were needed in the, sp in the spaces, in the cities, uh, and we um, somehow managed to send the cars with humanitarian aid to the places and then from that places to evacuate the art objects. So it wouldn't be such a situation that a car goes uh, empty 
and then comes with art object because you know the the roads were just full of cars and <laughs> like we didn't want to make the situation when you are just having an empty car and this is also something that we uh, faced with like um, from the very very beginning um, and I can understand that I can totally like understand the people's points of view, but before the first bombing of the first museum, which was the big case of the um, uh, Museum of Maria Primachenko, like a very important naive artist uh, uh, of Ukraine, before that case, um, we had some negative feedback um, about um, necessity, like if it's, is it really necessary f right now to evacuate art and not evacuate people? And uh, this was like this ethical dilemma, uh, which we um, somehow were confronted with. And uh, of course, we never prioritized, you know, art objects uh, more than the lives of people. Uh, but it was like this big work of balancing how to not take a space from, you know, people who have to be evacuated and to evacuate art objects. So. Um, Yes, this is. But after after the the first bombing happened, everyone understood that actually culture and art plays like is really in danger. And one of the focuses of destroying is culture itself. And uh, this is something that we have to uh, take care of because no, no one will take care of. And none of the mythologies, none of the uh, proposed uh, proposed methods how to save art uh, during the war do not work because um, all the corridors for evacuation, they do not work, <laughs> you know? It's not how it happens. Uh, Russian army just uh, kills people who are uh, in the green corridors. Um, how can we talk about art? <laughs> yeah. I will switch it off. <laughs> um, I think this is something that you already mentioned also, Sarah. I mean, this whole question of like saving people and saving art and then this collision of um, artists being especially in danger. I mean, I think in the, in the case of Afghanistan, as, Afghanistan, as you just mentioned, um, that um, art is seen as something that is not allowed to be happening in, the, in your country anymore. And I think this is a very important, um, I mean, when we talk about heritage and we talk about cultural production, this is a very important uh, part of this whole discussion that is not just about um, heritage as something that was produced in another time, but of people who are actually in the situation of producing art and this puts them in danger. So I think this is very important also to link it up to what you just said. Um, what I found also interesting in what you just said was um, this moment of ca getting out of the country to be in another place. I mean, you moved out of Afghanistan I think, in 2015, but you still continue to, um, yeah, to, to have a relation with the Af Afghani um, cultural scene. And maybe you can say a little bit more about, because I remember from the conversation that we had before the panel, uh, that you were running an art gallery in, in Kabul. And, and now you think about maybe continuing the work in another way. So maybe you can say a little bit more about that as a kind of a, yeah. as a strategy to find a future for you. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so um, about the gallery, first I have to say something. Uh, we started on 2014. Uh, and re also I have to say it was a really special time because uh, 2015 start the situation in Afghanistan getting um, how to say gradually bad because in 2014 the um, um, international community and USA um, uh, um, decided to uh, bring out their troops from Afghanistan and it has a big um, uh, effect on the society and especially in security situation but uh, beside all these uh, problems on security issues, we start this gallery because there isn't any gallery. We had just national galleries and there wasn't any gallery that you can show uh, without any sensua. We had also, yeah, in 20 years, uh, lots of things happened, but still we had also lots of problems. 
um, um, but uh, in this case, we start this gallery. But um, right now, even our works are from the gallery is still in Afghanistan, and uh, some of the artists we could able to evacuate it somewhere. Afga in, in, most of them is in Frank, uh, French, uh, France, uh, was, uh, on here in Germany evacuated. Um, but uh, their works are there. Even they couldn't take it with them, with themselves, because it's completely taboo. It could be more dangerous for them if they just left also Afghanistan to have their art piece, maybe one or the two at least, but they couldn't take it. That's all, everything is um, left it behind there. But uh, it's also, um, yeah, this is the one case that we at least to, um, uh, how to say, to save the life of those who are producing art. And, uh, but they need also some special platforms and some um, supports here. And um, I'm also, I'm always thinking about the alternatives, not only in art section, but in every section, even political and economy, because uh, the Taliban, this is authority, they are always trying, they are showing that they are self in a, um, strong positions. And that's why the uh, world community, Afghans, always pay something for, to some costs. For example, in terms of education, they close the educa uh, all the schools and they are bringing more pressure on the international community to give them somehow legitimacy or uh, recognition. But we should try to develop alternatives to bring uh, this pressure a little bit, uh, how to say, down and to sit with the, when there is a table to sit or to come in a dialogue with them to. Uh, uh, have a dialogue with them, with, with also from this side, with strong positions. And also in art situation, yeah, the situations right now there in Afghanistan completely catastrophic, and all the ways are blocked, but at least we have the artists here, but how we can give them here platforms, how we can bring them, or give them so a platform that they at least produced here to come to the yeah, art market is a little bit maybe far away, but at least to show their self and to express their self. And that's why I'm thinking uh, about uh, the making this gallery again as like an e-gallery, so uh, like, uh, not sorry, um, uh, online gallery, I mean. So um, that would be also a possibility. Yeah, um, it's not... Uh, uh, it would be not like this that we are working in Afghanistan with the same idea or the uh, goals to introduce the arts, to uh, produce art in this country, to change the minds, or the, how to say, to have an influence in the people and their minds. But at least we should also uh, not uh, just sitting on doing nothing on saying we are because there is no possibility, but there is there is lots of possibility. On one would be, for example, these alternative platforms on uh, like uh, online or I don't know what kind of, at the same time these artists needed also, how to say, um, uh, connections, not only with their communities, also here in, th in these countries that they all already came, they need also here these connections because we know all those who are working in art sections so that in culture, it's going also with connections. <laughs> Without connections, it's not possible. <laughs> so that's why, yeah, and this is my maybe next uh, step or the next uh, plan to uh, do again this gallery here in Germany, but online, to give at least a platform for those who are outside of Afghanistan that they work uh, a little bit. Yeah, maybe not, they are, they are not going to work so strongly as they did it on Afghanistan, but at least, mm -hmm. so there would be a possibility, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So maybe I just pick up uh, the term of network and uh, relationships to build up and come back to you, Tobias, because you mentioned that uh, the work of, of Kulturgutretter and of the network, of archaeological network, is not only um, in terms of uh, intervening into crisis and going there with a whole group of people to uh, yeah, to, to go into action and, and help in the locations, but to support the infrastructures that are already there. That means also to help people who are working in the institutions um, with support, be it material support, with uh, what you just mentioned, sending packaging material or protective material, but also in um, being, being um, addressable for them, I mean, just to kind of, yeah, 
being there with your knowledge with uh, other ways of it. Maybe you can explain a little bit more what that actually means and how that works. Um, I think I can explain that on, is this working? Yes. Um, on uh, two different levels. One is uh, what we are doing now with Kulturgutretter, which is really uh, what we do, these missions, they will have, they must have a beginning, which is shortly after the disaster and of course uh, giving precedence to humanitarian uh, aid. But then as soon as we can, we would like to be there and help. Uh, and help means we will not be there alone because there will be local forces trying to deal with the problem. This might be civil protection, military, uh, but also cultural heritage experts from the place. So these are the people that know best what we are dealing with because it's their context, their cultural context and their, their, their place. Um, and then of course, these missions must have an end. So we can only do the, let's say the work that an ambulance is doing. We are doing the, we are helping with the main, most important things. So uh, the first steps that you need to do, uh, and this is a minimal, these are minimal procedures and then, uh, this, this must have an end, and then you can only give recommendations on how it will move on. But this whole process is something that is uh, always going on, not uh, strangers coming there and doing it, but always in uh, interaction with the local experts and the local uh, decision makers, of course. Uh, also talking about the question, what is to be preserved or what is, has a priority. In the best case, for example, a museum has a prior, prioritized, prioritized uh, inventory. So they know which part is more important to say first and then second. I think in many cases, even in Germany, this is not always the case. So um, this is the, the best case is that everything is prepared. So whoever is coming there is, uh, can be briefed and do it as it is planned. And then you, you mentioned problems like the <laughs> corridors, with how, to, how to get away things um, in a conflict, of course. Um, so the other thing is the archaeological heritage network, the projects that I mentioned before. Um, those were not for this moment directly after the crisis, but they have had a more long time, long term or mid term approach and a broader approach. So uh, projects, for example, that started as um, on site trainings in different countries to train experts in cultural heritage uh, skills. Um, then also COVID came in, so it was difficult to, to, to conduct <laughs> these trainings on site. So uh, our colleagues in these projects, they switched them to, on, to online or remote teaching and remote projects. So people on site did their projects and they uh, were uh, tutored by, by uh, online, online uh, formats. Um, and in this way, we also produced a lot of tutorials and, and resources that are now uh, accessible online in different languages, so German, but more important English, Arabic in this case, because in this way we could address many, many people in the whole MENA region at least, uh, and, and over that. So uh, now Ukrainian as a language is <laughs> coming in as a, something that is needed. Um, but I think these were many, many uh, measures and actions that produced things that can be used again and again and then can, can be accessed by people all over the world uh, when the problem is there, when a crisis happens. So I think that's the difference between the two uh, approaches. Yeah, it's very interesting to, um, to see like how these kinds of infrastructures also react to, to situations that are happening in the moment. So as you just mentioned, that for example, Ukrainian becomes suddenly a language that is of importance in this in this uh, circumstances, but still I find it um, interesting. Maybe to come back to what we were talking about in the beginning, this differentiation between the protection of heritage and the protection of cultural production, because I think it's still important to kind of stay a little bit with this with this problem. Um, as you just mentioned, there is uh, mechanisms to um, um, how to decide what is. I wouldn't even say worth being protected, but like you have different categories of what is protected first and then other things follow. And I think in the field of, of, of contemporary art production, this becomes a very tricky thing. I mean, then you have the problem that maybe you have some art institutions that are that have more means, that are more prestigious. What, what happens to all the minor structures, to uh, art spaces, to 
um, grassroots organizations. I mean, this is something that you mentioned before. So maybe yeah. you want to say something on that, Anna. Yeah, uh, I also know um, that, like, except of our organization, that there there are a lot of organizations in Ukraine that face this um, dilemma: what are they sh what they should focus on right now, saving the heritage or uh, documenting what is going on. I know this is a case, for example, of a uh, museum of terror, which is in Lviv, uh, who launched uh, uh, like a big uh, network and program for, uh, which is called Museum Crisis Center. And though they are very much focused on the history of terror, and when the war comes, uh, it's like uh, the obvious thing that they have to, you know, uh, make a new content uh, about what is going on right now. But their decision, and I think this is kind of right decision, was to actually save what is already existing. And they were focusing, um, as like I can agree with your uh, position, that uh, maybe right now. Um, it's even more important to save the experts who can work with this heritage. And they were focusing on the museum workers, especially the museum workers in, for example, Lugansk region, who uh, are left in the occupied territories without uh, salary, without money, and they would just, you know, give them the first uh, hand um, uh, money just, uh, you know, on their bank accounts. But um, coming back to our initiative, uh, we had the chance to work on both sides, like uh, saving uh, cultural heritage and producing new, um, new objects, which uh, became like a big focus of ours. Um, because when we launched this residency that I was talking about, one of the ideas what was actually to make, to produce new um, material things Though before we were like always very much focused on the process oriented residencies, we were never were about material th uh, things, especially from the terms of like ecological uh, sense and that material production always you uh, you know leaves this uh, um, tr like traces you know in the ecology. But when the full scale invasion started, we realized that in the uh, situation of destruction, like material destruction, we have to produce something new. And this is how it all started with uh, this residency, which is called uh, uh, Working Room. And it's called like that because we realized that we want to use this residency as a working room and to provide the working room for those who lost the rooms for productions, for the displaced people, like displaced artists who, you know, came from Kyiv, Mariupol as well, to ivano Frankivsk. And um, yeah, and I um, I can't say that they are very deep, uh, deeply reflectional. Yet, yeah? yes, they are very somehow reactive. Though we were a lot, a lot of time we spent talking about how not to make a reactional work, how to make a reflection. But in order to make a really deep reflection, the war has to end. And in order to make a distance, the war has to end. Uh, you know, you cannot make a distance uh, in the sit being in the situation. Um, but yeah, this is uh, somehow um, we were keeping in mind that uh, producing these new objects, we would like to uh, tell the story from the inside because there are a lot of artists, the cultural work workers who. Uh, for many reasons left uh, country and this is great that, that there are a lot of opportunities for Ukrainians like really thank you for you know everyone uh, who made this happen uh, our like foreign friends and colleagues but in Ukraine we realized that, that there are like ac actually not many opportunities for those who decided to stay and the material production is something that has to be present because uh, you know, it works like that. The the artists should have this production in order to continue the, their reflection and in order to um, stop being a um, moving target. Because as long as you start doing art, you also stop being a target and you change your position into uh, a subject subjective position, into position of someone who can produce 
you know, and not just to be, um, yeah, a target. It's uh, very interesting. <laughs> and it's almost, I mean, to me, it almost sounds like a contradiction that you would produce material objects in a situation where material objects are also in, at risk. I mean, it's kind of a very interesting um, thought and a very interesting way and completely understandable. I mean, I very much like what you just said, like to kind of insist on this um, yeah, subjectivity of being an artist and producing, I mean, something that is expected from you, producing something material, which is, as you said, also a contradiction to how you worked before. And also, I mean, as you just said before, uh, Sarah, that um, in the case of Afghanistan, this is almost impossible because there is no way of, of, of producing material work. So where you also see how very different these two situations are and that you are actually thinking of more going, to in, going into the digital space because it becomes a little bit less tangible and maybe even less, um, yeah, less um, uh, tangible also in the way of, 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 of having it in the location, but it becomes virtual in a way, and maybe easier to evade the situation. Uh, yeah, because uh, in case of Afghanistan, as I said also before, there isn't any other way. Um, and also, um, this is um, maybe the only solution right now for a short time because uh, it doesn't mean uh, also we don't the problems yeah it's completely um, with Afghanistan situation we don't know how long the Taliban going to stay or going to how to say going to have the power in Afghanistan this is also a question and the same times because Afghanistan such, uh, Af with Afghanistan case more politically and you don't know what's going to happen with when. For example, in 2001, so just in one, two days, the whole um, world community was of the parties in Afghanistan, they come. And now also just with, uh, in a six day, a country with 35 million people with lots of potential just fall down. So that's why it's so difficult to have a expectation from the situation of Afghanistan, what's going on, because there's lots of hands are playing in this, it's a more game, and that's why um, in this case, uh, it's so difficult to uh, work, especially in this um, uh, section, to uh, safeguarding on uh, protecting of art and culture and uh, um, monuments, but uh, digitalization would be an um, a alternative maybe for a short time, because uh, one thing I should also say in Afghanistan, also in the last 20 years, so art was a section that was not really happened much, uh, how to say, there was, yeah, when we are going to uh, compare with other section, uh, there was also some, um, um, uh, how to say, progresses happened, but it was not as much that it should be. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it makes in this case now a little bit easier because mostly uh, so the uh, mostly um, uh, was working in, uh, more artists was working in uh, visual art in art section and culture, but not we have so uh, for example we don't have um, I'm not sure if I didn't say it wrong we don't have maybe not more than a ten museums or galleries so in this uh, section it makes. It could it make the work easier, uh, yeah. But in this uh, because uh, the, as I said, the other uh, side was more uh, happening. So there was lots of artists who worked so individually or with the groups or the organizations. So um, it, that's why it would be a alternative. So this is digitalization and mostly also uh, work was what happened in the art section was. Uh, somehow also digital, so it was uh, with films, so photos, yeah, there was also lots of uh, happened with the, in the section of um, painting, but we can, how to say, we can uh, um, um, save them because they are already left there. And even the uh, artists in the 16th of August, 15th of August, as they heard that the Taliban coming, they destroyed by themselves. And it's so sad. I have videos. I have um, not. I have, but I have also from my friends that they because they was totally traumatized from the first regime, and they don't know what's going to happen when they are coming 
uh, in Afghanistan. And they destroyed by themselves their artworks. So not the Taliban, not the uh, bombs or the rockets, but they destroyed by themselves because it was not sure what's going to happen for them. If the Taliban going to find them, they prefer to destroy it by themselves as the Taliban find them and they are going to uh, give them punishment. So um, that's why digitalization is a, for in case of Afghanistan right now, I think because the most of work was also so digitally or uh, in this uh, um, visual art happened, so it would be a possibility to, at least for a short time, um, to work in this, in, I would say, in this, uh, in this way, but not for a long time. Of course, we need also to keep this heritage. We had the heritage that's more than 1,000 years, so all they should be kept, and they should be also something happened to be safe or not destroyed, yeah. Mm -hmm. But first, we should also prioritize what is the priority or what we can do in this critical time, at least something, so maybe that would be this digitalization, uh, mm -hmm. um, or that going to in digital way, um, small possibility that we have right now at least. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I mean, now you gave me the keyword digitalization because I also wanted to speak with you about that. As I mean, as you just mentioned, it is a possibility to continue work or to produce new work, but on the other side, it is also a problem, as you just mentioned, Tobias, that um, there is digital data in archives, in museums, but it is also very, um, yeah, it is at risk as well, because, I mean, what happens uh, if the uh, digital archive of a museum gets destroyed? And as you mentioned, there's also locations or you provide space to uh, transfer the digital data from one place to the other in a safer place or a safer environment where it can be held. And I think there's also kind of a, or what this whole discussion or the, the possibilities of the digital also provides is uh, that it creates completely new relationships with the material that is digitized and, uh, and the, the, let's say, original places. So maybe you can say a little bit more about this whole moving around of digital data and what it actually produces. Um, yeah, I think, uh, as you said, uh, you have to save the materials or the pieces for the collection, but uh, the, the same thing is to save or to, to back up in that case the, the digital information on the on the cultural heritage. I mean, if uh, now we can open a big discussion about uh, the value of digitalization of, of cultural heritage, because of course, uh, what does that mean? We can talk about uh, archival information on a collection of a, on a museum collection. So this is like the metadata we would say. But uh, we can, uh, it's easy to talk about uh, 3D scans, point clouds, or whatever. So you can scan, you can digitize cultural heritage pieces. That's nice, because in the case, it's, it get, really gets destroyed. It is at least one testimony of it. But I mean, we all must know that it is not, it does not never comprehend the whole material uh, evidence uh, piece, for example, a uh, yeah, museum piece has or something from a certain time, it, be it contemporary art or uh, ancient uh, pottery. So um, this is just uh, the, the worst case. But in this case, we have at least the digital documentation. We are talking a lot about this uh, in the project. For example, if, you, uh, if we have to, to work in a, in a historic building, um, how, to what extent do we document actually the, the geometry or the surfaces? Um, because in this moment, it is more important to, to see what is urgent, what is, has to be done now, and it's maybe uh, a question of what is the risk of this building being destroyed in the next period that you will immediately do a laser scan or do some digital documentation, which can never take the whole value of the material, of course. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's a difficult question, but those are some aspects, I think. You know, one thing that I found very interesting in doing preparation for, for this panel discussion um, was uh, kind of a, it, what is it called, it's Sucho, I guess? It's called Saving Ukrainian... One second. It's a platform that was created by, um, I think it's financed by Amazon and some other players uh, that are providing a platform to... Uh, yeah, to safeguard um, Ukrainian heritage. I mean, you can basically add whatever digital data you have to this platform. 
but at the same time it creates a whole new space of, of Ukrainian heritage. And I found it very interesting like how because we are speaking about like the uh, the categories that are um, provided by museums, um, for example, what what counts as heritage, what does not count as heritage, or does not yet count as heritage, and a website like that suddenly provides a new a new layer to that, so it suddenly becomes a new uh, way of of defining heritage. I don't know if you if any of you ever encountered this website and or if you had a look at that no okay so maybe <laughs> you should check it out um i don't know how we are time wise we have, a bit of time. we have a bit of time yeah but i mean maybe there's already questions from the audience so please if anybody wants to join the conversation raise your hand i think we have a microphone here so please go ahead Hi, uh, my name is Tahani. I work at the Museum of Natural History here in Berlin. Um, and as a follow-up uh, to what Regina just said, um, this is maybe more of a kind of philosophical question. But what what, ac what happens with like Afghani cultural heritage and or Ukrainian cultural heritage and cultural production if it if it moves to a space provided by Amazon or if it vacates the territory and it's suddenly in the digital realm or it's in the diaspora? Yeah, I think it's it's a very good question because we we are also very much thinking about like this movement of uh, you know art objects. Um, when we launched the program of evacuation, uh, we had a lot of uh, requests from our foreign friends and colleagues who were saying we have spaces here abroad. Uh, we can uh, you know take these archives here. Uh, tell us what to do, uh, we are ready to help. And um, except of the big, big legal question and legal problem problems with, uh, not problems, but like, you know, um, um, a huge amount of work in, in a legal um, form uh, for taking artworks from one country, from Ukraine to abroad, we were also thinking about um, the possibility to save something for Ukraine because there is such a big um, movement of art objects and artists and cultural workers abroad, which is also great because this is a way people here also get to know about Ukrainian culture, UK Ukrainian art. This is how pieces get um, a safe space, safe place. But in a way, um, somehow, you know, a territory, a country also has to be connected with its heritage. And for me, it's hard to explain right now, you know, in details why is that, but it's something that I very strongly know. <laughs> And uh, it's also something that I can tell about um, the artists who are staying in Ukraine and um, and are abroad. I think there should be um, there should be more connections between them because I feel like right now connections are losing themselves, and that's bad because we need both sides. You know, we need people who are on the place and who are. Um, maybe more into the situation and they have um, you know a lot of to say but then at the same time we have uh, people abroad who have who has um, much more connection and um, ability to, to speak to people here which is like a big big a piece of work that has to be done so I would say that I would love to see this both sides being right now more connected and um, yeah, more in the contact. Um, yeah, maybe I didn't fully answer your questions, question, but that is something that right now is very much in my head. Um, um, so <laughs> your questions already, it's 
difficult because I also said before, because all the ways are difficult, even there is no way to collect or to bring some of this heritage or these collections or this art um, pieces out of the country, but uh, and also bringing them to another country or in the diaspora, that would be a, be a very good possibility. But right now in Afghanistan, it's not a possibility, it's closed. But it could be possible maybe with dialogue, um, uh, politic dialogue, so with the Taliban, but uh, in this time no one have, um, it's also not the time to have a dialogue with them. Uh, but in the, uh, but I have, uh, Afghanistan had also the experience, uh, I think it was, if I don't say the wrong um, um, uh, year, it was I think in 1990 or before the Taliban, it was the, um, another war, uh, uh, Burger Creek, uh, civil war in Afghanistan, and uh, the, uh, the Afghanistan government authority on that time, they uh, bring, they uh, brought the um, uh, um, bacterian tre uh, treasure. On that time, I think the U USA or the some countries or the uh, Gross Britannian, uh, maybe from, West two, uh, from these two countries, and uh, to just uh, give them to keep them, because on that time, the situation was not good for them for this heritage, and it was really, um, it's from bacterian uh, time. And they just bring it and give it them back to Afghanistan and uh, before the fall. And before the fall, there was exhibition in the president uh, palace in Afghanistan to show this heritage and this collection. And we don't know right now what's happening with them. But yeah, on the last 20 years, they were somehow, they keep, but right now, we don't know what happened with them and what did the Taliban. And this is really a big challenge. When we are going to, for example, I'm really happy that in Ukraine, so beside all this crisis on this tragedy, but there are some um, programs from the other uh, uh, neighbor countries, for example, Germany, they are working to somehow um, save this heritage. But in Afghanistan, unfortunately, I didn't see at least so any program from our these countries, those who involved in Afghanistan, and even from our neighbor's country. But our neighbor's country doing to their, what they happened, uh, what they did in last time, in the civil war time, and also in Taliban regime. More most of them, they collect these um, art pieces and they bring it in the black market and sold it for them or even keep it for them. And still we don't have the information. Uh, sometimes uh, when I'm going to some museums, I see the Afghanistan, um, um, how to say, um, heritage uh, from long time, but it's not in the name of Afghanistan. They are mostly by the name of Iran, Pakistan, and yeah, because they just, uh, how to say, they did it like this, they bought it, on bringing it to the black market because in the la last 20 years, uh, nothing happened in this section to archive, to, uh, how to say, to find uh, what was or that what happened with them. And they just, um, most of, um, unfortunately, even in Louvre, I saw there was uh, some things from Afghanistan, but you see it's the name of Iran or in the name of, uh, yeah, I saw with the Iran. So that happened. So. Uh, as I say, unfortunately, in this case, it was not lots of happen, or it was not seriously. Somewhat, there was not a serious work that happened. Other than even the Afghanistan, last one year, they signed uh, some conventions. Uh, out the UNESCO, they are also signed the uh, UNESCO. They are part of the UNESCO. As a, but right now, with this de facto regime, it's totally difficult. So, yeah, to do something practically there in this case. Mm. Yeah. No, thank you for raising this um, dilemma of um, what happens to heritage that leaves the country. And also thank you for what you just mentioned, like this whole connection that it, once heritage, cultural heritage leaves the country, it's very difficult to get it back. I mean, we see this with this whole discussion about restitution and everything. But uh, I think it's a very important um, important point to think about a little bit more. Because when is the moment that heritage can return? I mean, how do you define a safe environment or a safe uh, moment in time to make this move back possible? But maybe Tobias, you can say a little bit more about that. Also in terms of, um, because you also mentioned um, the, the black market, I mean, mm. objects that yeah. leave the country through uh, illegitimate ways. Uh, no, I just wanted to pick up on what you said uh, about uh, the people, uh, maybe 
in your case, maybe the artists leaving the country, uh, being refugees, and the, the art or in, in what in our perspective, the cultural heritage is staying there, so it's still at risk. Um, I mean, the same thing might happen with the with the scientists and the museum culture heritage experts, people working with the with the cultural heritage, with the cultural assets, be it buildings or collections. Um, and now you were touching somehow this point of tangible and intangible heritage, I think, because the, the material culture, it, 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 uh, it's created in a certain environment, in a culture, in a time, in space, in a society, uh, independent if it's ancient or contemporary. And then uh, these, the people that have created it or are safeguarding it and are also uh, communicating it because cultural heritage survives because there are people uh, pointing out the value of the cultural heritage, otherwise it's neglected and it will uh, get destroyed on the long term. So that's, uh, still it won't be there anymore. Um, so when experts or artists doing this important work of pointing out the importance of art or cultural heritage are going away, then it's, it's, a, it's a problem. So uh, I think this is, uh, I don't know, I have no experience with this, but I, I imagine that uh, you cannot separate a certain amount of time in, in which the cultural heritage will be neglected sooner or later because people forget. Uh, and this is uh, a question of quantity because uh, you talked about art rooms and museums and important museums and what is saved first. Uh, we have the same problem everywhere with uh, built heritage because there's not only the big national museum or uh, famous palace, but there's also vernacular architecture that is uh, cultural heritage. And it's sometimes neglected. Um, and it's hard to, to decide what, what to fund first or what to save first, even, not even in a crisis, but also in the long term in heritage conservation. Mm. No, thank you very much for pointing out that it's a whole ecosystem of culture that keeps everything together. So maybe there's another question from the audience. Yeah. Um, hi, thank you. So my question is actually about historical buildings or cultural buildings that might not qualify exactly as heritage because I don't know exactly what the qualifications are for heritage, but if we say historical buildings from the last 300 years or whatever, um, in, in illiberal states where the people do not have any chance of having a transparency on what, how decisions are made, why certain areas are given up to big industrial projects. Um, so my question is about protecting cultural heritage from aggressive capitalism or industrial modernization. Is that also part of the work that you do, especially the German Archaeological Institute? And do you then try to have some leverage, leverage with the countries where you are in? Um, do you also work with civil society organizations? Uh, I, I think I can answer to this with an example from our uh, Orient department, from the Institute. Um, one of the key events for our project Kulturgeräte was of course the, the blast in the Beirut port in Lebanon, um, in which you know there was also the historic city center uh, heavily destroyed and uh, historic buildings um, were damaged. Um, of course, this was a wonderful place for investors to easily buy out the owners and then take the buildings down if they are qualified as heritage or not. I mean, in our project, it's, we think it's not our role to decide what is of more or less value on a pla when we go to a mission. Um, but in this case, uh, efforts from different organizations, also from the Blue Shield and other organ uh, international organizations, of course, try to save these buildings. And uh, our Orient Department uh, from the German Archaeological Institute uh, together with the uh, local initiatives, because there were plenty of, of uh, local experts, architects, engineers that united in different initiatives to, uh, to document, to assess the damage and uh, to document the value of the, of the buildings and their contents um, to save them from being bought uh, by investors. Uh, and at this moment, uh, in these weeks, there's also a, a program going on by our Orient Department um, for teaching um, artisans in Lebanon, in Beirut, um, historical building techniques so they can uh, restore these buildings. 
So there's a sustainable way of putting um, awareness because this is also raising awareness amongst people observing it, among specialists, among architects, uh, and then I hope also politics. Um, so these buildings can be saved. So this is, these are different initiatives, I think, that, that uh, can be a strategy. And in this case, it seems that it works. But it is, uh, in this case, again, uh, because there were also a lot of local initiatives that were trying to save these buildings. Thank you. Uh, it's just really interesting topic for Kiev right now. We have a really very beautiful last 200 years buildings which are destroyed even during the war. And uh, it's more or less a civil um, kind of initiative of the neighbors to protect it. And for example, it was a Kvito Ukraine, uh, a building in the center of Kiev, which was uh, bought, like you said, you know, to build some business thing. And uh, people just came out on the streets and created an initiative to stop this. But they were suited and they were brought to the court and the architect is alive and he was also brought to the court. The question is, if there is some European initiatives, groups, that people, they're my really good friends who make this initiative, they can kind of go to be consulted or to be protected because during the war it become more and more complicated just because of the energy, because just going out and to strike became kind of a really not a thing. So maybe uh, there is some direction that countries that just building up their own initiatives can follow. So, of course, I don't have the perfect solution for the uh, th what you described. Um, I can only uh, go back to the case of Beirut that this only worked because there was a mid or long term uh, engagement of these organizations of our department as well in this country and they had the network because these are networks amongst cultural institutions and cultural people so they somehow run not this is not a political level but you are these, these are networks that exist and that are activated in that moment so they can help really fast uh, so in this case it was luck that several organizations had local networks so they could activate and join the, the locals uh, so they w would be heard outside and abroad and so uh, this, all these uh, forces were united to save the, the buildings. Um, I, I think this is uh, what was the lucky case in, in, in Beirut. I don't know in, in your case how it can be solved, but I'm sure we can talk about it later as well. I think unfortunately we have to come to an end. Or oh, was there? Nobody's here. I will try. Uh, um, my name is Marina. I'm a film director and uh, I'm originally from Ukraine. Um, I just, yes, I want to just share my thoughts. I thought uh, maybe um, um, I've arrived after uh, in early March uh, 2022 with my mom and our um, dog. And um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, I'm a film director, and one of the goals was, of course, to to go with my mom and save her place because she's ill and so on. Uh, but when I hear my colleague, you know, from Ivana Frankivsk, uh, Anna, of course, we know each other a little bit. Um, my goal of here as an artist, I'm finishing film, for example, which I shoot to, uh, before the war, and all my thoughts about it just to finish it. And I was asking myself, okay, now we're safe, I can, now I can come back. And the two questions only I had, I had in my head, okay, should I go to documentary, of course, or should I go to fight direct? or I stay here and I talk with this audience. I also speak German and I studied in Germany. <coughs> and I realized that Ukrainian culture was here not present at all, like in the meaning of understand us and to have the voice. And first of all, I think it's so much important that we will um, support people and artists who stay in Ukraine, that they can be active in some any way, um, survive and uh, have this, keep this document, this experience in any possible way. 
And the second thing, which I also support, that all artists who are here, uh, they, they kind of have their also some kind of mission or role to speak about Ukraine. That's the, 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 the question for me more, how we speak. And uh, of course, I can speak uh, uh, my thoughts on him now what I share, that I know that I will finish film and as soon as possible I try to come back. But I always ask myself, what can I do and how to keep the voice which will be uh, really, I don't know, it's not correct to say fresh, not fresh, but how can I be an, or um, show the picture objectively, which is also not possible, perhaps. That's why I'm also happy for those we are survived here and I'm really, really um, thinking each day of my colleague who is in Ukraine now and I'm really really thank you for what did you do I think it's very important because one of my part of my body was always there you know, always so if I would not have these materials which I have to finish so I that's and about heritage the I hope that all heritage will come back to Ukraine and the people as well of course it's our heritage thank you Thank you. I just uh, shortly wanted to comment that, like what you said about speaking, like how to speak. I think that's the like one of the biggest problems, not problems, like problems and questions right now. But what I believe in is that, uh, like maybe you remember this um, time when it all just happened, and it was like very much difficult to uh, to speak actually. There were people who, in uh, under adrenaline, started to make things. Uh, I was one of them. I immediately was doing things, but for me, it was as well hard to uh, to speak, like actually, you know, to talk, uh, like with my mouth, <laughs> and it was like a big um, crisis of a language uh, because it somehow s somehow it disappears because of the you know tragedy, and I know that there were a lot of artists who uh, at some point um, for some time lost their ability to speak through the art, you know, and um, what I find interesting is that. When you lose this ability to speak, somehow it um, means that the next step would be um, finding a new language. And I think this is what we are all doing right now. So, yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, these were very beautiful words in the end, I think, like finding a new language. That is, I think, what we are also trying to do, speaking about um, the protection of art and cultural goods, because we somehow walk through all these different sections. But thank you very much uh, for the conversation. I think it's not the end of a conversation. I mean, it's just a, a start and an, an in-between and hopefully a continuity. And uh, yeah, I hope we have more conversations about this and I wish you all the best. And uh, thank you very much again for coming to Berlin and spending the time with us. I think uh, we're going to have a next conversation. Mark André is going yes. to introduce. And thank you all to the audience and look forward to see you again. Thank you very much. Exactly.